anything that we do that does, doesn't go unnoticed by you and we we uh, know that lord everything we do uh, to your glory it stores for us a heavenly reward a treasure that we that is everlasting so lord we thank you for the work that um, dave's put in and we thank you lord for uh, your uh, empowering of him we pray that you would anoint him afresh now bring to mind all the thoughts and and, and things that you want him to speak and uh Help us to be attentive and listen and learn and be uh, changed, Lord, by the power <coughs> of your word and the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> All right, so we've got to Daniel chapter 6. Uh, I've entitled it part one, The Trap. Unfortunately, today we won't get on to Daniel in the lion's den. That's part in part two. So let's see what we've got in the first half. Daniel chapter six. So before we we take a look at chapter six of Daniel, let's get a feel for where we are roughly in the timeline. Uh, we're near the end of the, well, it was prophesied that the, they would be in Babylon 70 years. And they're getting towards the end of that 70 years. Some say it's about 68 years, so there's not long to go. So the first five chapters, if that's correct, is that it covers 68 years and the rest cover the remaining two years. And up to chapter 6, it can be called the historical portion. And as we get into chapter 7, that's then going into the prophetic part. So to bring us up to date, remember Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, he was slain. The city had fallen to the Medes and the Persians. Then Darius the Mede received the kingdom. And he was in his early 60s, whenever this time. Darius was an interesting character, as they say. According to the Bible critics, Darius did not conquer Babylon. He doesn't, in fact, exist in biblical record, in historical records. So their argument goes that the Bible is wrong. Daniel is wrong. You see how the argument goes. We know that King Sirius conquered Babylon because other historical records say so. The critics argue that the account of Daniel doesn't harmonise with the Babylonian and the Persian accounts. The problem that the critics have is that the records don't actually harmonise with each other either. But of course, it's the Bible that's wrong. Oh, it's the Bible that's wrong, what they say. But it's the same old story. And if the Bible is correct, and they admit it, they have to do something about it. And that is something they don't want to do. So because they can find evidence that Sirius existed and not Darius, it does cause doubt. Doubt in people's minds that then undermines the entire Bible. And this is a ploy direct from the enemy, as we know. Stop believing in Yahweh's word. But in the northwestern corner of Iran, there's an inscription chiselled into a rock face and it starts like this thus speaks Darius the king it's there I'm not going to say black and white but it's not it's in stone etched in stone even that's even better isn't it 
And it's about 50 foot high, apparently, these, these letters. So the evidence is there that Darius did exist. Anyway, that's just an introduction. So Sirius conquered Babylon and gave the kingdom to Darius to look after. So let's have a look at verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was with him. And the king planned to set him over the whole of the kingdom. So it pleased Darius. In other words, it was what Darius wanted to do. He set up what was, in effect, to the 20 regional governors. Uh, the empire was so vast that no one person could look after it all on their own. These regional governors, governors were in charge of their own little part of the empire, and they reported to three high officials. And one of these was Daniel. So Darius was setting up his rule so that the king would not suffer loss of any kind. You can imagine uh, with such a vast empire, taxes and things like that might just get mislaid. You know, it doesn't need to be a vast empire for that to happen. But it needed watching over carefully. That's the thing. So that works out that each high official had 40 satraps to watch over. I get the impression that uh, Darius was an organiser. He was put in charge to sort things out, ready for when Sirius did eventually take over. And of course, putting Daniel in such a position was not surprising, considering he had served under Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. He knew how things worked, and he was a righteous man. Daniel was loyal to Yahweh, and hence was loyal to whichever king he was under. He acted in a righteous manner, and was an honest and trustworthy man. You get the impression that Darius was a wise man, and he knew the satraps needed close watching over. If you think about it, three are easier to deal with than, uh, than 120. So Darius set these three men who he thought would be trustworthy. But Daniel distinguished himself above all the others. Not because of his own ability, but because he had an excellent spirit, as the passage tells us. He had Yahweh's spirit within him. This shows us that by being one of Yahweh's children and not compromising who we are, people do trust you. They might call you, they might, might, might make fun of you behind your back, but they know who to come to when it comes to trust. You will stand out, and in the end, you will be rewarded. So here we see Daniel being considered to rule over all the kingdom. But Daniel had one problem. He was a foreigner. And Daniel was straight and could not be influenced by others. They didn't like that idea. Verse 4. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel 
with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. No error or fault was found in him. Can you imagine one of our modern day politicians um, being in power for 50 years and no one could find anything against them? They don't need to be in power a few years and they find somebody against them these days. So <clears throat> that shows how righteous Daniel was. And of course, these days they dig deep, they find out everything about your past, the slightest thing, and they're all over it. Well, that's the type of scrutiny Daniel was going through. But unlike the leaders of today, nothing could be found. No fraudulent expenses. No intern scandals. No questionable business deals. No gifts from lobbyists. No accusations from his staff. We've seen a, quite a bit of that going on just recently, haven't we? To put it in simple terms, there was no skeletons in Daniel's closet. They even looked very closely at his character to try and find out any fault in him. But this is not to say Daniel was perfect and sinless. He would have had to be the son of God for that to happen. But he was a man of great integrity. Now, that in itself would cause problems because they want to get things out of their position that they're in. You know, a lot of people seek power and position and it's to get something for themselves. But when you've got a leader who's got integrity, it spoils it for them. So they tried to stop Daniel rising to the top purely for their own gain. It is said that few great men finish well. Daniel was an exception, and he epitomizes the words of the psalmist in 92, 12 to 15. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are even full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. I like that line, they still bear fruit in old age. I'm glad about that. So I'm getting there. Not quite, I'm getting there. As we well know, this is not the first time that Yahweh has raised someone up to power in a foreign land. Joseph in Egypt did exactly the same. But it was not their own talents that got them there. It was Yahweh who lifted them up. It just shows that when we remain righteous in all that we do, Yahweh will honour that. But there's MHs again. <laughs> oh, it, Yahweh will honour, 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 honour that. And, be, and the promotions will come without striving for them. Verse 5. Then these men said, Well, we, we, shall find, we shall not find any grounds for complaints against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. You get the impression that these men really didn't want Daniel to rule over the kingdom. 
They knew Daniel very well and most probably knew his daily routine. Having tried to find something against him and couldn't, they now turned to something that they knew he would do. They realised that Daniel would still praise his God no matter what the law says. So I've got a quote from McLaren. The world may not know the details of doctrine or the intimacies of worship with God, but they can tell a bad temper, selfishness, conceitedness or dishonesty when they see it. The world is a very poor critic of my Christianity, but it's a very sufficient one on my conduct. And I'm sure you've all come across it when somebody says, and you call yourself a Christian when you've done something. I used to have it a few times when I was at work. (laughs) So they set out to come up with a plan that would cause a conflict between the law of God and the laws of the land. Of course, we are open to that conflict every day. And by setting ourselves apart from this world and living by Yahweh's standards, we are predictable in our responses and therefore an easy target in this world. So verse 6 6 to 9. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps, the counsellors and the governors all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man For thirty days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the lion's den. Or den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius, sign the document and injunction. A couple of quotes now. One from Archer. The suggested mode of compelling every subject in the former Babylonian domain to acknowledge the authority of Persia seemed a statesmanlike measure that would contribute to the unification of the Middle and Near East. The time limit of one month seemed reasonable. But then Clark says, What pretense could they urge for so silly an audience? Ordinance. Probably to flatter the ambitious ambition of the king, they pretended to make him a god for thirty days, so that the whole empire should make prayer and supplication to him and pay him divine honours. This was the bait. But their real object was to destroy Daniel. They knew that uh, if everyone came together and hounded Darius, he would most probably give in. A crowd around you can be quite intimidating. It would take a very strong person to resist that. If everyone else was in agreement, Most people would go along with it. Those who shout the loudest usually get what they want, especially in today's world. Now, when they said all the governors were in agreement, that was not strictly true, was it? I don't think that they had consulted Daniel over this. But this is a typical, this is typical of the enemy and the way he attacks the kingdom. It almost uses the truth. So if you're not paying attention, 
You could miss the line and get caught out. And that reminds me of Psalm 2, 1 to 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The people plot in vain. The same thing is happening today. We are supposed to have free speech, but as long as it fits in with the world view. When we, we stand for our God, we stand against the world view and the nations, and the people will rage against us. Daniel's time was just the same. If you are straight and good and shine like a light, it shows their darkness up all the more. They don't like that. And they hate to be reminded of what they are. They will try everything to bring you down so their darkness looks normal. And that makes them happy. Of course, at that time, when a king, he spoke for the gods. And the gods, they're never wrong. So any decree from the king must be right. And they can never be changed. Even the king cannot alter it. So as they pushed for what they wanted, they knew if the king signed it, they had Daniel. So what they are saying is to the king is, let the people show their allegiance to him and lift Darius up above all the local gods. As we know, this is a big problem if you're a Jew or in modern day a Christian. So therefore Darius signed the decree. So the scene is set and they wait to put their plan into action. Just imagine if our government one day passes a law that you could not pray to your own God for a week. Doesn't seem a long time, does it? And if you do, you'll be thrown into the lion's den. Face the consequences. But how many Christians would follow the government and not pray. How would you react in that situation? We know how we'd react in this church. Because we've had a similar thing with the, uh, the lockdown, etc. Isn't it? it was, it's the same principle. We know where, how we would react which is good, because we stood up. So, this is an example of when the law clashes with God's law. Which will you follow? Would you have the faith to stand strong? This is when we would be really tested, and we would find how much we trust in Yahweh. But none of us know how we would react under such circumstances until it happens. Spurgeon. Suppose the law of the land were proclaimed, no man shall pray during the remainder of this month on pain of being cast into the, lion, the den of lions. How many of you would pray? I think there would be rather a scanty number at the prayer meeting. Not but what the attendance at prayer meetings is scanty enough now. But if there were the penalty of being cast into the lion's den, 
I'm afraid the prayer meeting would be postponed for a month. In a lot of churches it would. Owing to pressing business and manifold engagements of one kind or another. I think you'd find people wouldn't actually say, no, we're not going, oh, we're busy, we're doing something to avoid doing it. Ten, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house, where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. He'd always done it. He'd done it previously. Daniel was confronted with this very dilemma, but it seems he had no second thoughts about it. He just carried on, as would be his usual routine. It might appear that Daniel went out of his way to make a point, but he was just doing what he always did. Daniel was a loyal subject of the king, but his loyalties to the king of kings was greater. Now these, these windows were little more than holes in the wall. And they could easily be looked through. I don't think they had curtains. But Daniel refused to give to the government the measure of obedience that belonged to God alone. And that's the thing. Daniel was just being obedient to Yahweh. So he carried on with his daily routine in the privacy of his own home. He wasn't drawing attention to himself. He wasn't protesting. He wasn't jumping on snooky tables and covering them with orange dust. He knew full well that he might get caught. But he placed his life in Yahweh's hands. I suppose in a way he was making a stand, but not making a scene or trouble. he just get on with it. Have you ever wondered why Daniel prayed facing Jerusalem? Was it his own idea? Or uh, a longing to be back in Jerusalem? No, he prayed according to scripture. Because in 1 Kings 8, 47 to 49, we find this. Yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they had been carried captive and repent and lead with you, plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If you repent with all your heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carry them captive and pray towards their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city, that you have chosen and the house the high have built for your name then here in heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their plea and maintain their course and in 1 Kings 8.30 it says this and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place and listen in heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. So Daniel was just following the scriptures, because they clearly say, pray towards Jerusalem, and they will be blessed. I wouldn't know where Jerusalem was from here, what direction. But just on a side note, whenever possible, modern synagogues around the world are constructed so they face Jerusalem. They're based on this passage in Daniel. 
Some critics say Daniel was written much later. But the Jews believe Daniel is true enough to base their synagogues on it. If they had one ounce of doubt, they wouldn't do that. McLaren, unless you are prepared to be in the minority and now and then be called narrow, fanatic, and be laughed at by men because you will not do what they do, but abstain and result and resist, then there is little chance of you ever making much of your Christian profession. And this is Woolvoard. There was danger in both directions. It would have been compromised, compromised to do less or pride to do more. This was not the act of a person caught in martyrdom, but the continuation of a faithful ministry in prayer, which he had characterised his long life. Daniel knelt before the Lord in prayer, as many do in the Bible. Why did he pray three times a day? He was a busy man. He was helping run the kingdom after all. Think about it. A little prayer is good. Much prayer is far better. Daniel prayed on his knees three times a day, no matter how busy he was. He didn't make excuses. He made it his priority. Doubtless he prayed many times a day as great men of God often do. Most probably be a quick prayer to get him through some difficult task. But three times a day he prayed formally, day in, day out. Spurgeon says this, he prayed and gave thanks because great prayer is filled with thanksgiving. Prayer and praise should always go up to heaven arm in arm. Like twin angels walking up Jacob's ladder. Or like kindred aspirations soaring high, soaring up to the most high. 11 and 12. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O oh king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any God or man within 30 days except to you, O oh king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. They had set their trap. It paid off for them, so they can catch their prey. And finally, go running to the king. Daniel was being a rebel, I suppose, in the eyes of the world but being obedient in the eyes of Yahweh. There's a saying, one man's hero is another man's terrorist. It's down to how you look at it. The rabbis and sages have struggled with this problem. And then when you put Romans into the mix, it gets very complicated. And the church has struggled with this problem as well. So I'll read from Romans 13, 1 to 7. Let every person be subject to the government governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? 
Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant, for your God. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed. Honour to whom honour is owed. I think that's what most, a lot of churches follow that. But then, we have Mark 12, 12 to 17. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. For they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, Whose likeness inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marvelled at him. So where does that leave us? Most probably even more confused. So, I'll try and explain. So what are believers to do when our government makes the law that directly contradicts God's law? Some say we have to always follow the government law, even if it contradicts God's law. We see this thinking in the church today. As churches feel they have to obey the law of the land at the expense of following God's law. The world we live in makes what God calls evil, good. And what, no sorry, the world we live in makes what God calls good, evil. And what God calls evil, good. How should we respond? Did Christ and Paul intend for us to meekly submit to government law, then stand opposite to God's law? If that's the case, then was Daniel legalistic and self-righteously wrong in his actions? Should he have stopped praying for a month to follow the decree? Or, as the way believers are to respond today to such a challenge changed since Jesus' time? These are all things we must think about. And unfortunately, the waters have got muddied over the years and Christians don't follow the full teaching of the Bible. They don't understand the morality that God sets out in the full Bible. Both Testaments direct us to divide away from moral issues of divinely defined right and wrong 
from the financial and fairness issues that are all about like or dislike. Put another way, there is a clear dividing line between moral choices and personal preferences. I'm confident that both testaments make it clear that is that it is non-moral issues that are being contemplated when it comes to believers obeying our human governments. But when those laws contradict the moral laws of God, Jesus would want us to follow God's law, not the laws of man. Remember the saying, WWJD, used to get wristbands with it on. What would Jesus do? But in this study in Daniel, it could lead us to say WWDD. What would Daniel do? And the fear of the outcome should not stop us from following God's law. Anyway, back to the scriptures. So they remind Darius of the decree he's just signed and got acknowledgement that it still stands. So they check the waters first, 13. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed but makes his petition three times a day. 14, then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he laboured till the sun went down to rescue him. They struck with their plan and reported Daniel to the king. Darius' heart must have sunk. He suddenly realised he'd been set up. Their plan was perfectly executed and the king was trapped. He couldn't alter the law. The king was deeply distressed. He was about to lose his trusted governor. And you could get the impression that he felt guilty at being set up by these men. He tried everything to get Daniel out of it but there was nothing he could do because according to the ancient eastern custom and customs the execution was carried out on the evening of the day that the accusation was made and found valid and Darius tried right up to the last minute but it was all in vain 15 then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. They were not going to let it go. And again reminded the king he couldn't change anything because it was the law. So I'll finish up with this. As we get to chapter 6, we see that the prophecy of the nation being in Babylon 70 years is nearly up. Darius the Nemede was put in charge of Babylon to sort it out, to get it organised. So the Medes and the Persians liked it. He put 120 satraps in charge of the empire and appointed three governors over them and Daniel was one of them. With Yahweh's help, he excelled and was being considered to rule over the kingdom. Because Daniel, having the most excellent spirit, was as straight as he come and reliable. Darius trusted him. This passage shows us that Yahweh will lift us up. 
in everything that we do. Don't strive for success. Your way will give you success. To a level that he knows you can cope. Might sound strange, but we've been examples in our own congregation of this very principle. One man sat out his sent out his dissertation and ended up teaching in a university, doing a PhD. I'm sure you knew who that is. A young woman went to work in a preschool, ended up as a manager. And one man came down to support the church and ended up being the pastor. And I'm sure that there are others that this has happened to. Yahweh has lifted up these people because he, they just got on with their jobs. Just like Daniel. But when we are lifted up, you can expect opposition from the enemy. But just persist and you will succeed. By being righteous in your life and, and work, they will find it difficult to pull you down. Yahweh will look after you. So don't worry. Just keep focused on Jesus. Daniel is an example to us all to stand our ground when it goes against Yahweh's law, laws. Everyday life leads us to follow the law of the land. But when it crosses the morality of, in the Bible, there is a clear dividing line between moral choices and personal choices. Put Yahweh first in all you do. Life may not be as easy as you like, but you will succeed if you let the Holy Spirit go before you and don't get in his way. Amen. Thank you so much for watching to the end. If you like this video, please click the subscribe button to help this channel reach more people with the truth of the gospel. Thank you for your support and encouragement. God bless.